Welcome to Game Foundry Reviews. In this video, we're going to take a look at Tobago. In Tobago, players are searching for buried treasure on the island of Tobago. Let's jump right in with a description of the rules, see a few example turns being played, then I'll be back for some closing remarks. This is Tobago, set up for a three-player game to set up. You first assemble the board, and you can do that totally randomly. There's 32 different combinations, I believe. Then you place the huts, palm trees, and statues. The rules here are the same type of unit, must be at least four apart. So the statues, for instance, have to be all four apart from each other. Also, only the statues cannot be adjacent to the sea. Um, the palms or the huts can, as you can see one here. Also, the statues have to face a distinct direction uh, along the hexes. So he would either face this way, this way, this way, etc. Next, you shuffle the treasure cards and you put 12 aside, and then you're going to put the two curse cards into the bottom 27 cards and shuffle them. And the curse cards, for reference, look like this. So they're not going to be in those first 12 cards, but where they are in the deck beyond that is a mystery. Each player picks a color and places the ATV in that color anywhere on the map. Players can even place in the same spot, and then each player takes the comp roses in their color. Also, you flip the top card of the clue deck for each player in the game, so we're a three-player game, so there would be three cards flipped, and then everybody places one on an empty um, set of markers, and indicates it's theirs with their compass rose by placing that on the clue card. And then you check if any of the clues should be marked. Um, this means that it's next to one of these types of spaces, so there's a whole lot of them. There's only 17 cubes in each color, so there's way more than 17, because it's all these different spaces. This one, however, is next to the largest mountain, and you can count that this is the largest mountain just by the number of units in it as opposed to these other mountain regions. So we know that this brown treasure is in one of these four spots. So we already marked that. And lastly, this one just means it's not next to the sea. So there's a whole lot of places in the middle that it could be, so we can't figure that one out quite yet. And then there's one treasure here, the gray treasure, that has not yet put it, had a clue card put on it. But if there was a four-player game, it would. Um, then each player takes a hand of four clue cards. In a two-player game, you actually get a hand of six cards, and that's really the only difference. The game is played in turns in which players take turns in clockwise order until the treasure deck runs out. And at the end of the game, the player with the most treasure wins. On a player's turn, they can either play a clue card, move their ATV, or exchange their hand, as long as they don't have an amulet, but we'll get to that in a minute. So let's talk about playing a clue card. If a player chooses to play a clue card from their hand, they have to pick one of these areas here and place that card face up. So let's just say, for instance, this player put this here. He would mark it with his yellow, and now he knows that these gray cubes are in the river. And since there's not that many river spaces, there's less than 17 possibilities, you would indicate on the map that these could be out here like so. When you're playing a clue card, there's a few rules to keep in mind, and those are that you cannot contradict an earlier placed clue. So if uh, this says it's next to the largest mountain and it's only these four possible spaces, you can't play a clue that says it's in a river. Also, the clue card you play has to reduce the number of possible locations by at least one. So if under this one you played, it's next to a mountain, that doesn't give any new information. So that play would be illegal. And lastly, it has to leave at least one location where the treasure is. You can't totally wipe a treasure off the map. Any new cards are always played underneath the existing ones in the same treasure. Once a player has played their card, they just draw another one from the deck, so they always have the same number of cards in their hand. If a player chooses to move their ATV, they can move up to three legs. In this game, a leg is classified as one group of the same terrain or moving between groups of different terrain. So for example, as one leg, this player can move as far as he wants within the mountains. That could be one, two, and then again for his third, he could move as far as he wants within the forest. So that would be three legs. Alternatively, three legs could also be one, two, three, because you're moving between terrains. If while moving, a player stops to dig up a treasure, any additional movement they had was lost. So if we just pretend, for instance, that the black treasure was right here and this player chose to move, even though he would still have two more moves for his turn, he's got to stop here if he wants to dig up that treasure. We'll go through digging up a treasure in detail in a moment, but the last thing you could do in a turn is exchange your hand. You have to exchange your whole hand of cards, and then you draw that many new clue cards, and that's it. You don't get to move or play a card that turn. Also, you can only do this if you don't have any amulets. Once you have an amulet, this is no longer an eligible action for your turn. So for digging up treasure, there has to be only one eligible place for that treasure on the whole map. So in this example, that's the only black cube left on the board. So that's where the treasure is. In order to dig it up, your ATV must be on that space. And if you, again, if you move there and you decide to dig it, you're done movement, even if you have more moves to make. However, if you start your turn on a space with a treasure, you can actually dig it up, and then after all the treasure is distributed, you can uh, take your turn as normal. So you could play a clue card, or move your ATV, or what have you. So to dig up a treasure, you put one of your compass roses below the lowest clue card. Let's lay out another one here and just put someone else's rose on it to demonstrate this. And when this happens, you give out treasure cards to each player based on how many compass roses they have. So for digging it, you have one, and this guy's also played a clue card. So he would get to look at two of these treasures. He gets to look at them, see what they are, and then green will get one. In addition to those treasures, you always take one from the deck. So there's one that nobody ever knows what they are. And then you shuffle them up 
and you uh, begin to flip them one at a time. And it goes down in order. So Red will get to say, Red, do you want to take this three? And Red might say, no, I'm going to wait for a bigger one because he already saw a five. And then Green has the choice, and he'll say no. And then it goes back to Red again because he's the last one here. He might just discard it or he'll say yes. So let's just say Red says yes. He gets rid of his compass rose, and he'll take that treasure and put it face down in front of him. And you continue doing this one at a time until all of the... Uh, treasures are gone at the end you're going to wipe out all those clue cards and whoever took the last um, treasure and what that means is let's say um, this one went and green passed so it's out it's discarded and then red takes this one so green takes this last one which would be a four even though red took way more value and more cards if green takes the last one when all these are wiped out he gets to place a new card from his hand and uh, he'll start the new thing with a compass rose. So there's always going to be a card in front of these once they're uh, excavated. But after playing that card, make sure you draw back up. You should always have the same number of cards in your hand. There's also some curse cards, and these are bad news bears. If a curse card comes up, um, you immediately stop the treasure distribution, so no more cards are going to be drawn this turn. And anybody who still has a compass, so if Red had already taken his two and he had no compasses left and it was just Green's one compass there, he would have to do this, but Red would not. Um, you either have to discard an amulet or you're going to lose your highest valued treasure card. And you would just take the highest valued treasure card from face down in front of you, show everybody, and then discard it. And then afterwards, all the other treasure cards that were under this one um, get discarded as well. Also, uh, the curse itself gets removed from the game. And there's two curses in the deck, so even if the other one was in that stack and didn't come out, that's removed from the game as well. It's also possible that you reveal the curse card first, in which case nobody has claimed the most recent treasure. Um, so the, in that case, you still discard all the clues, and the person that dug it up gets to start the new treasure by playing a clue and putting their marker on it. Every time a treasure is dug up, afterwards, amulets are going to appear on the uh, field. So what you do is wherever these statues are looking, you go all the way until the sea at the edge, and you lay out an amulet, and then you rotate him one space clockwise. So they would come out here. And also, they only go out on empty spaces. So it's possible that there's already an amulet there, in which case you wouldn't put another one. Players can pick up amulets on their turn. If they start on the same place as an amulet, they can pick it up and then take their turn as normal. Um, otherwise, they have to move and end on that amulet. So for instance, if this guy was here, he couldn't just pick up this amulet on his way down here, even though that's still one leg. He'd have to end a leg here, pick up the amulet, and then continue moving for the rest of his moves. Unlike digging up a treasure, it certainly doesn't stop your movements totally to pick up an amulet. Players can use amulets during their turn, even the turn they pick them up, to do extra actions. The amulet has a few abilities. It can remove sight markers, allow you to play extra clue cards, allow you an extra move with your ATV, allow you to exchange clue cards, and also, as we just discussed, it protects you from the curse in when they come up. If you still have compass roses, you got to discard them, or you're going to lose your highest value treasure. So if you use it to remove a sight marker, you just discard your amulet back to the supply here. It never goes out of the game or anything. And you can just remove a marker from the board. So for instance, if I wanted to remove one from the brown, I just take one and, and put it back in the supply. This space now cannot contain the brown treasure, for instance. So that can be pretty interesting. Also, you can just discard them to play an extra clue card. Or if you chose to move as your action, you can discard one before or after moving um, to play a clue card. So it's basically just an extra action for your turn. You can also do that with moving. So you can discard an amulet to have an extra move. The one catch here is during the move that you discard the amulet, you cannot pick up another amulet. For instance, if I had this amulet here and I, I chose to move first, I could move here, pick up another amulet, and then complete my move. But if I did my first move with the amulet, I wouldn't have been able to pick up another one. And lastly, you can use an amulet to exchange all the cards in your hand. Remember, if you have an amulet, you cannot take this as your regular action. Um, you have to use the amulet in order to exchange all your cards. The game ends after the treasure deck runs out during distribution. You still finish that distribution using cards from the discarded pile as necessary, shuffling them together to form uh, another stack. And then after that's complete, whoever has the highest value of treasures is the winner. Let's get going with this example playthrough. Normally players' hands are for their eyes only, but we're going to have them face up here. We're going to start with yellow, and he's going to play a clue card onto this gray treasure. He could play on any treasure he likes as long as he follows the placement rules. So he puts his yellow marker there, and he lays out these cubes because now there's definitely less than 17 possible spots. Actually, those three are already there, and these other ones go here as well. So then it's uh, the green player's turn after yellow draws back up, because remember, you're always going to have the same number of cards. And he's going to play this one on the brown treasure. And what that means is the treasure is within two spaces of a tree. 
So he can do that because he has eliminated one possible location. Because this, this, and this are all within two spaces, but this one over here is three spaces away from a tree. Remember, he couldn't play that unless he actually narrows down the location. So he draws back up, and then it's Red's turn. Red can exchange his cards, play a card, or move, but for right now, he'd really like to uh, play a card. Red decides to play not in the biggest mountain next to this one here. So he marks it, and now we know that this is neither next toward the sea or not in the biggest mountain. So he's only narrowed it down by a couple spaces, so it's still pretty vague. And then the game's gonna continue like this. We'll jump ahead to when somebody uh, raises a treasure so you can see somebody move and raise a treasure. Welcome back, it's now Yellow's turn. I apologize for this, I'm just trying to make it easy to see. So he's gonna choose to move. So for one move, he's gonna go one, two, because that's in the same terrain, and then three. And he's landed on this gray, and that's the last gray on the board, so he's going to choose to dig it up. So he throws this away, and he puts one of his markers at the bottom. Now he gets to see three cards, because he has three compass roses, and red gets to see two cards, so they're going to take them in their hands and secretly look at them, so that uh, no one else knows what they are. And then they're going to put them together, along with one card from the deck that nobody gets to see, and then they're going to shuffle them up, and it's always gonna go in this order. So yellow's choice first. Yellow, do you wanna take that four? And he says no, then it goes to red. And he says, okay, I'll take that one. So he takes his compass rose back, puts his face down in front of him. The next card's a five. Yellow says, yep, I'm gonna take that. So he takes his compass rose back, takes the five. But now we're gonna be starting with red because there's a nothing here, so we'll just discard it. So red says, uh, no, I don't want the two. Yellow doesn't want the two. Yellow doesn't want the two, so it's discarded. It's okay to discard one card usually because there is one extra. And then red, do you want this four? He says, uh, no, I think I'm going to hold out one more time. So yellow happily takes the four, and there's a two. Red definitely doesn't want the two, but yellow uh, will take it because it's better than nothing. So he takes it, and then red uh, takes a three. He was really hoping for something better than a four. But fortunately for him, he was the last person to take one, so that means he gets to be the person to lay out a new card for next time. And he's going to say that it is in the biggest forest. So we know it's here, so we can already mark that on the map because that's definitely less than 17 spaces. And um, now, because a treasure was dug up, we also have to lay out amulets. And the way we do that is we look where these are, and, and don't forget to make sure you draw back up after you place this card. Look where these statues are, and you lay them out all the way at the sea. So red's gonna be starting on one, that's why he started there. And uh, one goes down here. And remember, they turn one space, so they're not gonna keep putting them on the same area. And then green's gonna get one here as well. So then it continues like that. We'll join back up when we hit a curse. Welcome back, this real big treasure has just been dug up. So red's gonna get to see three cards from the deck. So he's gonna look at them very carefully. And then yellow's going, or green's gonna get one, and yellow's gonna get one, two, three and there's a curse there. Then you're also gonna add one from the deck, so the deck is gonna be empty, so at the end of this turn, it's gonna be done. If there was more compass roses than there were cards in the deck, you would just take the discard pile, shuffle it, and then the additional cards would be drawn from here. You always use the whole deck first. Um, these are shuffled up, and Red gets to take a look at one first, so Red sees a five. Red says, yeah, I'm gonna take that five, so he's just gonna take it, and uh, that's his now, so it's Green's pick. Green sees a four, and uh, Green's pretty scared because he knows that last curse is out there, so he's gonna take that as well because he doesn't even have any amulets. Um, so he puts that and this is gone. So yellow, oh no, yellow sees the curse. Fortunately for Green, he's not here anymore, so he doesn't have to play an amul amulet because he doesn't have a compass rose here. But both yellow and red need to play one or they're gonna lose their highest valued treasure. So each of them plays an uh, amulet and the rest of these are discarded. Nobody gets to see them and the curse is removed from the game. So now that the deck is empty, we count up the points and whoever has the most wins. To determine who has the most points, you add up the value of all the gold. So for instance, this one would be worth two and uh, this one here would be worth five. I don't usually talk about component quality in my reviews, but the components in this game are top notch. In particular, the statues are really well made and they have a nice texture to them that makes for a great experience. The gameplay itself is very simple and I don't consider this as much of a treasure hunting or deduction game as the theme would imply, though it, it's certainly there. But that's because you're kind of playing cards and dictating where the treasures are located. They're not predetermined. 
Um, there's also a lot of luck, you know, with what types of cards you get and what comes out, but there is the real neat pressure luck element uh, when you actually dig up the treasure of, you know, should I take that one or should I wait? Also, there's the fact that if you wait till the very end and you take the last one, you get to start the next uh, search. And that can be real good because you get a card out there nice and early. I'd recommend this strongly for uh, family settings. It's, it's not super strategic or anything like that. So if people are really into Euros, um, they might get a little frustrated with the simplicity of this one. But it's a neat game. It plays well and it plays fast. That's Tobago.